Good afternoon. This is Chaplain Fritz. We have been looking at the topic of living in grace, which is another way of speaking about the topic in Christian doctrine, uh, the doctrine of sanctification. And to make that a little bit more practical, we're talking about how then a Christian is supposed to live. How do we put Jesus teachings into practice for after all that's what Jesus was after um, those who put his teachings into practice are the ones who follow him truly in this uh, course then on Christian living living in grace how to utilize the grace that saved us the grace that's also preserving us in our faith um, how do we live out of that faith on a day-to-day -day basis? We have looked at what the gospel is. We have looked at what the gospel does in us. It creates repentance. It creates desire for God and so forth. Uh, we looked under that subject uh, at the distinction between law and gospel and how that distinction is uh, a biblical distinction. And... Um, each of their usages and proper roles and places in the Christian life experience need to be um, uh, guarded and uh, honored and respected. Um, we have looked at the issue of repentance associated with that, the issue of heart idolatry. Uh, we are still uh, inclined to be what we are. That is, by nature, we are sinners. Uh, morally, we're being transformed by the renewal of our mind through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But in our natures, we are still sinners and we need to repent of the sins we daily commit. Um, then we looked at how the gospel is not only working in us, but as it works in us, we end up being agents of um, change and transformation. Uh, towards those who are around us. And so how does the gospel work through us? We're in that final third segment of this class. And we've looked at the topic of the mission of the Christian in this world. Um, there is the aspect of internal cultivation of our Christian um, life experience, faith experience with Jesus. Um, the important role of the Holy Spirit, of course, to be in tune with the Spirit, to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading and guidance, always in conjunction with the Word of God. And that, of course, is an emphasis that is um, the hallmark of the Reformation. The Protestant Reformation emphasized that the guide for the Christian in this world is to be led by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit who enables us to apply the Word of God in our lives. We've talked about the subject of forgiveness. We have recognized the fact that in the life, in this world, uh, in our own lives, uh, we may have uh, been treated not so nicely. We may have been offended, hurt by people. We may have hurt others by uh, doing sin ourselves toward them. And so there's always this ongoing need of forgiveness, to either receive forgiveness or to extend forgiveness. And it is to be part of the, the staple, the mainstay of a Christian faith experience is to be a forgiver, as well as to be ready to receive pardon um, and also um, the request uh, that may come our way when people ask us to forgive them. Then today I want to look with you at the lesson nine, which talks about the subject of conflict, particularly conflict and resolution. So you can tell that we are still in that um, area of the class where we are trying to understand how the gospel applies to our personal lives and to the life of the church. Uh, how do we implement these calls to repentance, uh, introspection of the heart, 
and its condition as a sinful heart, um, the mission that we have to be a blessing to others through the grace that was extended to us, uh, the forgiveness that we extended, and now, as I said, conflict and resolution. We live in a broken world. That's pretty clear. Just a few days ago, did you witness the immense explosion that took place in the city of Beirut in Lebanon. 300,000 homes were basically destroyed, I read today. And even if that were an exaggerated number, imagine what it would be like just for you to live there right now and have your home destroyed by this incident. This is a broken world. We are dealing with sickness. We are dealing with COVID. I just came back from accompanying a family whose elderly parents are going through the struggle of seeing mom um, enter into her last days in this life to accompany them through this valley of the shadow of death. And to do so from the Christian perspective, to do so in a hopeful manner, not a manner that is, is just tragedy, what's happening, but it is okay. Because the Lord Jesus is the living Lord of life. He is the one who overcame death for us. And for those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that we await the great resurrection. And in that day, we will be forever transformed into the persons we will be in the presence of the Lord. But for now, we live in a broken world. We are sin still sinful, we said. We are um, physically, emotionally, in every aspect of our human identity. Um, the fall in Adam uh, has left its mark, uh, marks and, and uh, traces and scarring, if you will, upon us all. What's the big idea in this lesson about conflict and resolution? Well, the, I, the big idea is that we apply what we've learned in this class. And at the outset, we emphasize the fact that Christians need to know the gospel and they need to implement the gospel. It seems to me that too often Christians who visit the churches on a Sunday by Sunday basis, they know the truths quite well. When it comes to problem solving, there seems to be a tendency not to think biblically and to say, now here is a problem and how would scripture command us to think and then act? We're going to take a look at the need for resolution. When we look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 2 and verses 11 through 14, the Apostle Paul is referring to an incident that took place between him and the Apostle Peter. It says in verse 11, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used, that is Peter, used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, these Jews from Jerusalem, he began, that is, Peter began to draw back from these Gentiles and separated himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, 
you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you now force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? And we'll end the reading of that passage right there. So here you have among the best of God's servants, conflict. And how ought they to have conflict? Bible doesn't say necessarily that conflict is bad, inherently bad. Here you have a conflict that, that had to come about. Somebody had to stand up and rebuke the Apostle Peter because Peter was clearly in the wrong. Why was Peter in the wrong? Well, because Peter, Peter by his hypocritical actions, first affiliating with the Gentiles and comfortable among them, no longer keeping all the ceremonial parts of the law, suddenly he changes his behavior back to as if he could only hang around with Jewish people. And that was a divisive act in the eyes of the Apostle Paul. And the question is, do you think that Paul was too harsh with Peter? Was that very nice to stand up to Peter in public and to say to Peter, Peter, you must be consistent. We are not saved by the law. We're no longer under the law. And the law keeping should be strictly voluntary. And it is not uh, expected by anyone to bring us any standing before God because that would detract from the full and complete and sufficient work of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross. Do you think that Paul was too harsh? No, it was not too harsh when he spoke up in public because that is what was at stake, the gospel itself. And if we are saved by the truth of the gospel, then people had better know that there is no other way of salvation than through faith alone in Christ alone because of the work that Jesus accomplished on, in his death uh, and through his resurrection. So Peter was wrong and Paul brought it to his attention. If Paul had not spoken up at that very moment, what would have been the implications for the life of the church and the church's history in centuries to come? Would it not have sent the message that there is division in the church between Jews and Gentiles and that the verse that we know so well from the same book of Galatians where, Jesus, where Paul writes, and therefore there is no longer a difference between Jew and Gentile, between male and female and so forth, um, that truth uh, would then um, contradict the behavior that was Peter's in this instance. So when we are dealing with conflict and the need for resolution, it is once again important that we know the Bible, we understand the principles of biblical um, attempts at reconciliation, at peacemaking, if you will, and to, um, to apply those rules to these situations that we find ourselves in in life. And of course, it's a question that we need to ask ourselves right now is, do we know the gospel? Do we know the gospel well enough to be able to resolve conflict? So here we have a challenge before us where we need to ask ourselves, am I a student of scripture? Before I'm going to teach others what to do, I need to be a student of scripture. And so the teacher is always the student in the Christian faith experience. So how do we help, how does the gospel help us to fight fairly? 
Perhaps you can think of an argument that you had with someone, person in the church, person in the community, in your business interactions, um, perhaps in your marriage, you had an argument. Um, how did you behave? How did you fight, you might say? Usually there are two types of approaches to fighting. One is that you attack. You're there to win the battle. A typical opposite response to conflict is to turn quiet, to be defensive, and to avoid this situation. So when you think about that argument you had, who were you? Were you the attacker type, or were you the defensive type? If you're the aggressive person, you were perhaps venting your anger. You were um, arguing very passionately. You were explaining, giving all sorts of reasons why the other person is wrong. Maybe a little, maybe even a little bit aggressive. How do you know? Can you prove it? You are the person who is fighting until you win. And sometimes when we fight and we forget to implement Christian conduct and principles of behavior, we even become accusatory. We have forgotten that the person that we're arguing with is made in the image of God. And especially when we are dealing with a person who is a fellow believer in Christ, then we need to especially remember that love is kind. And because love is kind, the way we fight will determine whether we are keeping that principle of being kind even when we are disagreeing. The, the defensive person avoids the talk. Sometimes it can be frustrating between a husband and a wife. One is the aggressor, the one is the, the defensive person, and the aggressor starts, and uh, the other person just doesn't like that. And so that person becomes quiet. That person may experience that as, as stressful. And when we are under a certain level of serious stress, then our faculties, our abilities to think and reason and process thoughts and being able to speak sometimes um, gets compromised and it shuts down. And we feel totally miserable. We, who are like that, need to learn to fight. We need to learn to not be led by our feelings, but we need to learn to argue, but argue biblically, argue respectfully, and oftentimes, including in Christian situ in situations where Christians are at odds with one another, the fight is not always fought in the best way that we could have. So how do we resolve conflict? Well, the passage that we read from Galatians chapter 2 can help us with that. There was disagreement. And uh, Peter separated himself, we saw, from the Gentiles because he saw the Jews from Jerusalem coming and visiting them. And he thought that if he were caught fellowshipping, eating with Gentile believers, then the people who were his fellow Jews visiting from Jerusalem would have lost their respect for him. The fact of the matter is that when Paul argues the wrong Peter did, implied in that argument is that from Paul's point of view, 
Paul had lost his respect for Peter because he compromised at that moment the nature of the gospel. When Paul criticized Peter, he did not use accusatory language that was personal. He did not attack Peter as the person of Peter. He attacked his behavior. He questioned it. He criticized it. And once again, the reason why Peter uh, was accused by Paul is that Peter flip-flopped in his behavior, and that was confusing. After all, he was the apostle, one of the apostles, one of the pillars of the church, to whom people looked for guidance and direction. If Peter wasn't able to resist the temptation of legalism, then who could? And so it was very important that Paul speak up, and he did. And it was a blessing to the church ever since. We cannot um, have special preferences for certain groups of people. We are not respecters of persons. So what are some observations? Well, one of the observations is that Paul approached Peter directly. There was no talking about his, uh, behind his back. It was not via, as we would say today, via an email or a text. It was done publicly. Paul's motivation was not to defend himself or to have personal interests that would be favored by speaking up to Paul, maybe sinful ambitions that he would establish himself as a more respected apostle this way than um, the apostle Peter was. He just, Paul presented the issue plainly without personal animosity, acrimony, and uh, invited a response from Peter. And we know that in Peter's own writings, he refers to this conflict and he highly praises Paul for that. It was something that he had to learn. So we're saying this afternoon, conflict is sometimes necessary. We shouldn't have it every day. We shouldn't have it every other day. Maybe we shouldn't have it even every week. But you know what I mean. Sometimes when it is needed, conflict is a good thing. Especially when that conflict is resolved in a biblical way. Love, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, love must be the controlling motive that plays and decides in the fighting process. We can do so many things for God. We can give ourselves and our bodies in flames for Christ and His gospel. But if we don't do it because of love for Christ, love for God, then it means nothing. So the better way to fight is not to fight so that you can say you won the fight, the argument. Rather, the gospel directs our attention to coming to an agreement that by showing from biblical argument that a person's beliefs or practices are not in keeping with what the Word of God teaches. It's a blessing to the church when brothers and sisters in Christ are able to humble themselves, humble themselves daily before God and humble themselves in the presence of their fellow brothers and sisters in the church. With that spirit of love and kindness, there is the opportunity for repentance, for forgiveness. In reliance upon the Word of God, in reliance upon the indwelling work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we can seek to understand the other person, 
before we judge them. We can try to understand their reasoning before we clash and we break things. And sometimes relationships that get broken are beyond repair, so it seems. We have to be ambassadors of truth and we bring the truth in love. Speak the truth in love, the Bible teaches. So the gospel has to be at the center of our conflict and the resolution of conflict. So when we have a future situation coming our way, we can help the situation not get out of hand. When we know ourselves from experience, we know what we are like, how we behave when conflict comes our way. If we detect something that is not good in light of God's word to be rejected and done away with, repented of, let's be mindful of that so that that doesn't become a hindrance in our attempt to uh, find resolution in a conflict with another person. So know who you are, know yourself, know your natural tendencies, your way of responding to stress um, and clashes of this kind. Don't resolve in your mind that you're going to win this argument at all cost. That is not a Christian attitude. We're going to have the Word of God between us, and in light of the Word of God, we're going to argue our positions. And at the end, we shake the hand of peace and fellowship with one another because of our common agreement with the teaching and truth of Holy Scripture. The heart, we said, is exceedingly wicked. The motives of our heart are not all pure. It is important that we walk closely with God. And the closer we walk with God, in dependence on His Holy Spirit, the less conflict we probably will have, conflict that is the result of our own human failings. And we will be better able with more grace, more love, more patience, more understanding to resolve a conflict in which it is clearly the case, as it was between Paul and Peter, that as Peter was in the wrong, the other person we're dealing with is in the wrong, and we, by our attitude that is Christ-like, present the truth and then leave the result in our Heavenly Father's hands for Him to take care of that because we are not able to accomplish resolution. That is something that has to happen in, in the hearts of each of the par parties that we're dealing with. So conflict is part of life. The Christian is uniquely equipped to utilize the principles of reconciliation that the gospel itself presents us in the Word of God. May the Lord enable us to apply these truths in your and my day-to-day -day living and that there would be more peace in the church and greater harmony as we, in light of God's word, seek to combat and seek to win some arguments that are truly of great importance. Sometimes there need to be battle to win peace. The battle, the battleground where the question is fought what is the nature of the Word of God? Is it God's infallible, inerrant Word? Or is it really the product of the minds of fallible, sinful human beings? And therefore, and thereby, it loses completely its absolute 
authority over us. And we are weakened as preachers in the preaching of God's word from our pulpits if that were how we viewed scripture. That is worth a fight. It's another fight to discuss the origins of creation. It's another fight to understand economics from a biblical perspective. It's another fight that needs to be waged in how the church ought to conduct itself when it comes to members who disobey the clear and plain teaching of Scripture universally found in it. Because truth matters. Lives are impacted now and perhaps for eternity if we do not face up to challenges that come our way. But the question is, are these challenges fueled by humility, by love and kindness, and all the other virtues that are mentioned by the Apostle Paul, for example, in the text in Corinthians that I just noted. And so I pray that the Lord will bless you in your lives today and in the days to come, and that you will be able, with the Spirit's power and strength, to find resolution in the times and may they be few that you find yourself in conflict, conflict with another person, or conflict with people at work, or in your churches, or in your families, that these conflicts will be resolved in a God-honoring way, using the Bible. May the Lord bless you and give you strength to apply His truth to your day-to-day -day living. Thank you for your attention. Next time, and I'll do this momentarily, by the way, in a few minutes I will continue, and then we'll take a look at the last segment, or session, or lesson rather, and that is the topic of worship. So I'll see you in just a few minutes. God bless you.